hear and attend and listen. For this befell and behappened and became and was, O oh my best beloved, when the tame animals were wild. The dog was wild, and the horse was wild, and the cow was wild, and the sheep was wild, and the pig was wild, as wild as wild could be. And they walked in the wet, wild woods by their wild loans. But the wildest of all the wild animals was the cat. He walked by himself. And all places were alike to him. Of course, the man was wild, too. He was dreadfully wild. He didn't even begin to be tame till he met the woman. And she told him that she did not like living in his wild ways. She picked out a nice dry cave instead of a heap of wet leaves to lie down in. And she strewed clean sand on the floor, and she lit a nice fire of wood in the back of the cave, and she hung a dried wild horse skin tail down across the opening of the cave, and she said, wipe your feet, dear, when you come in, and now we'll keep house. That night, best beloved, they ate wild sheep roasted on the hot stones and flavored with wild garlic and wild pepper and wild duck stuffed with wild rice, and wild fenugreek, and wild coriander, and marrow bones of wild oxen, and wild cherries, and wild grenadillas. Then the man went to sleep in front of the fire, ever so happy. But the woman sat up, combing her hair. She took the bone of the shoulder of mutton, the big fat blade bone, and she looked at the wonderful marks on it, and she threw more wood on the fire, and she made a magic. <laughs> She made the first singing magic in the world. Out in the wet, wild woods, all the wild animals gathered together where they could see the light of the fire a long way off, and they wondered what it meant. Then Wild Horse stamped with his wild foot and said, Oh, my friends and oh, my enemies, why have the man and woman made the great light in that cave, and what harm will it do to us? Wild Dog lifted his wild nose and smelled the smell of roast mutton and said, I will go up and see and look and say, for I think it is good. Cat, come with me. Nenny, said the cat. I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. I will not come. Then we can never be friends again, said the wild dog, and he trotted off to the cave. But when he had gone a little way, the cat said to himself, All places are alike to me. Why should I not go too and see and look and come away at my own liking? So he slipped away after wild dog, softly, very softly, and hid himself where he could hear everything. When Wild Dog reached the mouth of the cave, he lifted up the dried horse skin with his nose and sniffed the beautiful smell of the roast mutton. And the woman, looking at the blade bone, heard him and laughed and said, Here comes the first. Wild thing out of the wild woods, what do you want? Wild Dog said, Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy, what is this that smells so good in the wild woods? Then the woman picked up a roasted mutton bone and threw it to Wild Dog and said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, taste and try. Wild Dog gnawed the bone and it was more delicious than anything he had ever tasted. And he said, Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy, give me another. The woman said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, help my man to hunt through the day and guard this cave at night and I will give you as many roast bones as you need. Ah, said the cat, listening, this is a very wise woman, but she is not so wise as I am. Wild Dog crawled into the cave and laid his head on the woman's lap and said, Oh, my friend and wife of my friend, I will help your man hunt through the day, and at night I will guard your cave. Aha, uh -huh, said the cat, listening. That is a very foolish dog. And he went back through the wet, wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild lone. But he never told anybody. 
When the man walked up, he said, what is Wild Dog doing here? And the woman said, his name is not Wild Dog anymore, but the first friend, because he will be our friend for always and always and always. Take him with you when you go hunting. Next night, the woman cut great green armfuls of fresh grass from the water meadows and dried it before the fire so that it smelt like new mown hay. And she sat at the mouth of the cave and platted a halter out of horsehide. And she looked at the shoulder of mutton bone, at the big broad blade bone, and she made a magic. She made the second singing magic in the world. Out in the wild woods, all the wild animals wondered what had happened to Wild Dog. And at last, Wild Horse stamped with his foot and said, I will go and see and say why Wild Dog is not returned. Cat, come with me. Nanny, said the cat. I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. I will not come. But all the same, he followed Wild Horse softly, very softly and hid himself where he could hear everything. When the woman heard Wild Horse tripping and stumbling on his long mane, she laughed and said, here comes the second wild thing out of the wild woods. What do you want? Wild Horse said, Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy, where is Wild Dog? The woman laughed and picked up the blade bone and looked at it and said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, you did not come here for Wild Dog, but for the sake of this good grass. And Wild Horse, tripping and stumbling on his long mane, said, That is true. Give it me to eat. The woman said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, bend your wild head and wear what I give you, and you shall eat the wonderful grass three times a day. Ah, said the cat, listening, this is a clever woman, but she is not so clever as I am. Wild horse bent his wild head, and the woman slipped the plaited hide halter over it, and Wild Horse breathed on the woman's feet and said, Oh, my mistress and wife of my master, I will be your servant for the sake of the wonderful grass. Ah, said the cat, listening, that is a very foolish horse. And he went back through the wet, wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild loan. But he never told anybody. When the man and the dog came back from hunting, the man said, What is Wild Horse doing here? And the woman said, His name is not Wild Horse anymore, but the first servant, because he will carry us from place to place for always and always and always. Ride on his back when you go hunting. <laughs> Holding her wild head high that her wild horns should not catch in the wild trees, wild cow came up to the cave, and the cat followed and hid himself, just the same as before. And everything happened just the same as before. And the cat said the same things as before. And when wild cow had promised to give her milk to the woman every day in exchange for the wonderful grass, the cat went back through the wet, wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild loan just the same as before, but he never told anybody. And when the man and the horse and the dog came home from hunting and asked the same questions as before, the woman said, her name is not Wild Cow anymore, but the giver of good food. She will give us the warm white milk for always and always and always, and I will take care of her while you and the first friend and the first servant go hunting. Next day, the cat waited to see if any other wild thing would go up to the cave, but no one moved in the wet, wild woods. So the cat walked there by himself, and he saw the woman milking the cow, and he saw the light of the fire in the cave, and he smelt the smell of the warm, white milk. 
cat said, Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy, where did wild cow go? The woman laughed and said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, go back to the woods again, for I have braided up my hair and I have put away the magic blade bone, and we have no more need of either friend or servant in our cave. Cat said, I am not a friend, and I am not a servant. I am the cat who walks by himself, and I wish to come into your cave. The woman said, Then why did you not come with first friend on the first night? Cat grew very angry, and he said, Has wild dog told tales of me? Then the woman laughed and said, You are the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to you. You are neither a friend nor a servant. You have said it yourself. Go away and walk by yourself in all places alike. Then Cat pretended to be sorry, and he said, Must I never come into the cave? Must I never sit by the warm fire? Must I never drink the warm white milk? You are very wise and very beautiful. You should not be cruel even to a cat. The woman said, I knew I was wise, but I did not know I was beautiful. So I will make a bargain with you. If I ever say one word in your praise, you may come into the cave. And if you say two words in my praise, said the cat, I never shall, said the woman. But if I say two words in your praise, you may sit by the fire in the cave. And if you say three words, said the cat, I never shall, said the woman. But if I say three words in your praise, you may drink the warm white milk three times a day for always and always and always. Then the cat arched his back and said, Now, let the curtain at the mouth of the cave and the fire at the back of the cave and the milk pots that stand beside the fire remember what my enemy and the wife of my enemy has said. And he went away through the wet, wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild lone. That night, when the man and the horse and the dog came home from hunting, the woman did not tell them of the bargain that she had made with the cat, because she was afraid they might not like it. Cat went far, far away and hid himself in the wet, wild woods by his wild lone for a long time, till the woman forgot all about him. Only the bat, the little upside-down bat that hung inside the cave, knew where the cat hid. And every evening, Bat would fly to the cat with news of what was happening. One evening, Bat said, There is a baby in the cave. He is new and pink and fat and small, and the woman is very fond of him. Ah, said the cat, listening. But what is the baby fond of? Oh, he's fond of things that are soft and tickle, said the Bat. He's fond of warm things to hold in his arms when he goes to sleep. He's fond of being played with. He's fond of all those things. Ah, said the cat, listening. Then my time has come. Next night, Cat walked through the wet, wild woods and hid very near the cave till morning time, and man and dog and horse went hunting. The woman was busy cooking that morning, and the baby cried and interrupted. So she carried him outside the cave and gave him a handful of pebbles to play with. But still the baby cried. Then the cat put out his patty paw and patted the baby on the cheek, and it cooed. The cat rubbed against its fat knees and tickled it under its fat chin with his tail. And the baby laughed, and the woman heard him and smiled. Then the bat, the little upside-down bat, that hung in the mouth of the cave said, O oh, my hostess and wife of my host and mother of my host's son, a wild thing from the wild woods is most beautifully playing with your baby. A blessing on that wild thing, whoever he may be, said the woman, straightening her back, for I was a busy woman this morning, and he has done me a service. The very minute and second, best beloved, the dried horse skin curtain that was stretched tail down at the mouth of the cave fell down. <laughs> because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat. And when the woman went to pick it up, 
Lo and behold, the cat was sitting quite comfy inside the cave. Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy, said the cat, it is I. For you have spoken a word in my praise, and now I can sit within the cave for always and always and always. But still I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. The woman was very angry and shut her lips tight and took up a spinning wheel and began to spin. But the baby cried because the cat had gone away and the woman could not hush it, for it struggled and kicked and grew black in the face. Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy, said the cat, take a strand of the wire that you are spinning and tie it to your spinning whirl and drag it along the floor and I will show you a magic that shall make your baby laugh as loudly as he is now crying. I will do so, said the woman, because I am at my wit's end, but I will not thank you for it. She tied the thread to the little clay spindle whirl and drew it across the floor, and the cat ran after it and patted it with his paws and rolled head over heels and tossed it backward over his shoulder and chased it between his hind legs and pretended to lose it and pounced down upon it again till the baby laughed as loudly as he'd been crying and scrambled after the cat and frolicked all over the cave till it grew tired and settled down to sleep with a cat in its arms. Now, said the cat, I will sing the baby a song that shall keep him asleep for an hour. And he began to purr loud and low, low and loud, till the baby fell fast asleep. The woman smiled as she looked down upon the two of them and said, That was wonderfully done. No question, but you are very clever, old cat. That very minute and second, best beloved, the smoke of the fire at the back of the cave came down in clouds from the roof. Poof! Because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat. And when it had cleared away, lo and behold, the cat was sitting quite comfy close to the fire. Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy, said the cat, it is I. For you have spoken a second word in my praise, and now I can sit by the warm fire at the back of the cave for always and always and always. But still, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Then the woman was very, very angry and let down her hair and put more wood on the fire and brought out the broad blade bone of the shoulder of mutton and began to make a magic that should prevent her from saying a third word in praise of the cat. It was not a singing magic, best beloved. It was a still magic. And by and by the cave grew so still that a little wee, wee mouse crept out of a corner and ran across the floor. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat. Is that little mouse part of your magic? Ooh, shh, no indeed, said the woman. And she dropped the blade bone and jumped upon the footstool in front of the fire and braided up her hair very quick for fear that mouse should run up it. Ah, said the cat, watching. Then the mouse will do me no harm if I eat it. No, said the woman, braiding up her hair. Eat it quickly, and I will ever be grateful to you. Cat made one jump and caught the little mouse. And the woman said, a hundred thanks. Even the first friend is not quick enough to catch a little mouse as you have done. You must be very wise. <laughs> that very moment and second, best beloved, the milk pot that stood by the fire cracked in two pieces. <laughs> because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat. And when the woman jumped down from the footstool, lo and behold, the cat was lapping up the warm white milk that lay in one of the broken pieces. Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy, said the cat, it is I. For you have spoken three words in my praise, and now I can drink the warm white milk three times a day for always and always and always, but still I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Then the woman laughed and set the cat a bowl of warm white milk and said, Oh, cat, you are as clever as a man, but remember that your bargain was not made with the man or the dog. 
and I do not know what they will do when they come home. What is that to me, said the cat? If I have my place in the cave by the fire and my warm white milk three times a day, I do not care what the man or the dog can do. That evening, when the man and the dog came into the cave, the woman told them all the story of the bargain while the cat sat by the fire and smiled. Then the man said, Yes, but he has not made a bargain with me or with all proper men after me. Then he took off his two leather boots and he took up his little stone axe that makes three. And he fetched a piece of wood and a hatchet, that is five altogether. And he set them out in a row and he said, Now we will make our bargain. If you do not catch mice when you are in the cave for always and always and always, I will throw these five things at you whenever I see you. And so shall all proper men do after me. Ah, said the woman listening, this is a very clever cat, but he is not so clever as my man. The cat counted the five things, and they looked very knobby. And he said, I will catch mice when I am in the cave for always and always and always, but still I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Not when I am near, said the man. If you had not said that last, I would have put all these things away for always and always and always. But I am now going to throw my two boots and my little stone axe, that makes three, at you whenever I meet you. And so shall all proper men do after me. Then the dog said, wait a minute. He has not made a bargain with me or with all proper dogs after me. And he showed his teeth and he said, if you are not kind to the baby while I am in the cave for always and always and always, I will hunt you till I catch you, and when I catch you, I will bite you. And so shall all proper dogs after me. Ah, oh, said the woman listening, this is a very clever cat, but he is not so clever as the dog. Cat counted the dog's teeth, and they looked very pointed, and he said, I will be kind to the baby while I am in the cave, as long as he does not pull my tail too hard for always and always and always. But still, I am the cat that walks by himself and all places are alike to me. Not when I am near, said the dog. If you had not said that last, I would have shut my mouth for always and always and always. But now I am going to hunt you up a tree whenever I meet you. And so shall all proper dogs do after me. Then the man threw his two boots and his little stone axe, that makes three, at the cat, and the cat ran out of the cave, and the dog chased him up a tree, and from that day to this, best beloved, three proper men out of five will always throw things at a cat whenever they meet him, and all proper dogs will chase him up a tree. But the cat keeps his side of the bargain, too. He will kill mice, and he will be kind to babies when he is in the house, just as long as he do not pull his tail too hard. But when he has done that, and between times, when the moon gets up and the night comes, he is the cat that walks by himself, and all places are alike to him. Then he goes out to the wet, wild woods, or up the wet, wild trees, or on the wet, wild roofs, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild lone. the elephant, O oh best beloved, had no trunk. He had only a blackish, bulgy nose as big as a boot that he could wriggle about from side to side, but he couldn't pick up things with it. But there was one elephant, a new elephant, an elephant's child, who was full of satiable curiosity, and that means he asked ever so many questions. And he lived in Africa, and he filled all Africa with his satiable curiosities. He asked his tall aunt, the ostrich, why her tail feathers grew just so, and his tall aunt, the ostrich, spanked him with her hard, hard claw. And he asked his tall uncle, the giraffe, what made his skin spotty, and his tall uncle, the giraffe, spanked him with his hard, hard hoof. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. 
He asked his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, why her eyes were red, and his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, spanked him with a broad, broad hoof. And he asked his hairy uncle, the baboon, why melons tasted just so, and his hairy uncle, the baboon, spanked him with his hairy, hairy paw. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. And he asked questions about everything that he saw or heard or felt or smelt or touched. And all his uncles and his aunts spanked him. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. One fine morning in the middle of the procession of the equinoxes, this satiable elephant's child asked a new fine question that he had never asked before. He asked, what does the crocodile have for dinner? Then everybody said, hush, in a loud and dreadful tone, and they spanked him immediately and directly without stopping for a long time. By and by, when that was finished, he came upon Kola Kola Bird sitting in the middle of a wait-a-bit thorn bush, and he said, my father has spanked me, and my mother has spanked me, and all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my satiable curiosity, and still I want to know what the crocodile has for dinner. Then Kola Kola Bird said with a mournful cry, Go to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, and find out. That very next morning, when there was nothing left of the equinoxes, because the processions had proceeded according to a precedent, this satiable elephant's child took a hundred pounds of bananas, a little short red kind, and a hundred pounds of sugar cane, the long purple kind, and seventeen melons, the greeny crackly kind, and said to all his dear families, Goodbye. I am going to the great gray green greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees to find out what the crocodile has for dinner. And they all spanked him once more for luck, though he asked them most politely to stop. Then he went away a little warm, but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up. He went from Graham's town to Kimberley, and from Kimberley to Kama's country. And from Kama's country, he went east by north, eating melons all the time, till at last he came to the banks of the great, gray-green, greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, precisely as Kola Kola Bird had said. Now, you must know and understand, O oh best beloved, that till that very week and day and hour and minute, this satiable elephant's child had never seen a crocodile and did not know what one was like. It was all his satiable curiosity. The first thing that he found was a bicolored python rock snake curled round a rock. Excuse me, said the elephant's child most politely, but have you seen such a thing as a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? Have I seen a crocodile, said the bicolored python rock snake in a voice of dreadful scorn. What will you ask me next? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but could you kindly tell me what he has for dinner? Then the bicolored python rock snake uncoiled himself very quickly from the rock and spanked the elephant's child with his scalesome, flailsome tail. That is odd, said the elephant's child, because my father and my mother and my uncle and my aunt, not to mention my other aunt, the hippopotamus, and my other uncle, the baboon, have all spanked me for my satiable curiosity and I suppose this is the same thing. So he said goodbye very politely to the bicolored python rock snake and helped to coil him up on the rock again and went on, a little warm, but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up till he trod on what he thought was a log of wood at the very edge of the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees. But it was really the crocodile, oh best beloved. And the crocodile winked one eye, like this. Excuse me, said the elephant's child most politely, but do you happen to have seen a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? Then the crocodile winked the other eye and lifted half his tail out of the mud, and the elephant's child stepped back most politely because he did not wish to be spanked again. Come hither, little one said the crocodile. Why do you ask such things? 
Excuse me, said the elephant's child, most politely, but my father has spanked me, my mother has spanked me, not to mention my tall aunt, the ostrich, and my tall uncle, the giraffe, who can kick ever so hard, as well as my broad aunt, the hippopotamus, and my hairy uncle, the baboon, and including the bicolored python rock snake with the scalesome, flailsome tail just up the bank, who spanks harder than any of them. And so, if it's quite all the same to you, I don't want to be spanked anymore. Come hither, little one, said the crocodile, for I am the crocodile. And he wept crocodile tears to show it was quite true. Then the elephant child grew all breathless and panted and kneeled down on the bank and said, You are the very person I have been looking for all these long days. Will you please tell me what you have for dinner? Come hither, little one, said the crocodile, and I'll whisper. Then the elephant's child put his head down close to the crocodile's musky, tusky mouth, and the crocodile caught him by his little nose, which up to that very week, day, hour, minute, had been no bigger than a boot, though much more useful. I think, said the crocodile, and he said it between his teeth, like this. I think today I will begin with elephant's child. Well, at this, O oh best beloved, the elephant's child was much annoyed, and he said, speaking through his nose like this, Let go, you are hurdy bee. Then the bicolored python rock snake scuffled down from the bank and said, my young friend, if you do not now immediately and instantly pull as hard as ever you can, it is my opinion that your acquaintance in the large pattern leather ulster, and by this he meant the crocodile, will jerk you into yonder limpid stream before you can say Jack Robinson. This is the way bicolored python rock snakes always talk. Then the elephant child sat back on his little haunches and pulled and pulled and pulled and his nose began to stretch. And the crocodile floundered into the water, making it all creamy with great sweeps of his tail. And he pulled and pulled and pulled. And the elephant's child's nose kept on stretching, and the elephant's child spread all his little four legs and pulled and pulled and pulled. And his nose kept on stretching. And the crocodile threshed his tail like an oar, and he pulled and pulled and pulled. And at each pull, the elephant's child's nose grew longer and longer, and it hurt him. <sighs> then the elephant's child felt his legs slipping, and he said through his nose, which was now nearly five feet long, This is too much for me. Then the bicolored python rock snake came down from the bank and knotted himself in a double clove hitch around the elephant's child's hind legs and said, rash and inexperienced traveler, we will now seriously devote ourselves to a little high tension because if we do not, it is my impression that yonder self-propelling man of war with the armor plated upper deck, and by this, O oh best beloved, he meant the crocodile, will permanently vitiate your future career. That's the way all bicolored python rock snakes always talk. So he pulled, and the elephant's child pulled, and the crocodile pulled, but the elephant's child and the bicolored python rock snake pulled hardest, and at last the crocodile let go of the elephant's child's nose with a plop that you could hear all up and down the limpopo. Then the elephant's child sat down most hard and sudden. But first he was careful to say, thank you, to the bicolored python rock snake. And next he was kind to his poor, poor nose and wrapped it all up in cool banana leaves and hung it in the great gray-green greasy limpopo to cool. What are you doing that for, said the bicolored python rock snake. Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but my nose is badly out of shape and I am waiting for it to shrink. Then you will have to wait a long time, said the bicolored python rock snake. Some people do not know what is good for them. The elephant's child sat there for three days waiting for his nose to shrink. But it never grew any shorter. And besides, it made him squint. For, oh, best beloved, you will see and understand that the crocodile had pulled it out into a really, truly trunk, same as all elephants have today. 
At the end of the third day, a fly came and stung him on the shoulder, and before he knew what he was doing, he lifted up his trunk and hit that fly dead with the end of it. Vantage number one, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere schmear nose. Try and eat a little now. Before he thought what he was doing, the elephant's child pulled out his trunk and plucked a large bundle of grass, dusted it clean against his forelegs, and stuffed it into his mouth. Vantage number two, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Don't you think the sun is very hot today? It is, said the elephant's child, and before he thought what he was doing, he slooped up a sloop of mud from the banks of the great gray-green greasy limpopo and slapped it on his head, where it made a cool, slippy, slushy mud cap all trickly behind his ears. Vantage number three, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Now, how do you feel about being spanked again? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but I should not like it at all. How would you like to spank somebody, said the bicolored python rock snake. I should like it very much indeed, said the elephant's child. Well, said the bicolored python rock snake, you will find that new nose of yours very useful to spank people with. Thank you, said the elephant's child. I'll remember that. And now I think I'll go home to all my dear families and try. So the elephant child went home across Africa, frisking and whisking his trunk. When he wanted fruit to eat, he pulled fruit down from a tree, instead of waiting for it to fall as he used to do. When he wanted grass, he plucked grass up from the ground, instead of going on his knees as he used to do. When the flies bit him, he broke off the branch of a tree and used it as a fly whisk, and he made himself a new, cool, slushy, squishy mud cap whenever the sun was hot. When he felt lonely walking through Africa, he sang to himself down his trunk, and the noise was louder than several brass bands. He went especially out of his way to find a broad hippopotamus. She was no relation of his. And he spanked her very hard to make sure that the bicolored python rock snake had spoken the truth about his new trunk. The rest of the time, he picked up the melon rinds that he had dropped on his way to the Limpopo, for he was a tidy pachyderm. One dark evening, he came back to all his dear families, and he coiled up his trunk and said, How do you do? Well, they were very glad to see him and immediately said, Come here and be spanked for your satiable curiosity. Pooh, said the elephant's child. I don't think you people know anything about spanking, but I do, and I'll show you. Then he uncurled his trunk and knocked two of his dear brother's head over heels. Oh, bananas, said they. Where did you learn that trick? And what have you done to your nose? I got a new one from the crocodile on the banks of the great gray-green greasy Limpopo River, said the elephant's child. I asked him what he had for dinner, and he gave me this to keep. It looks very ugly, said his hairy uncle, the baboon. It does, said the elephant's child, but it's very useful and he picked up his hairy uncle, the baboon, by one hairy leg and hove him into a hornet's nest. Then that bad elephant's child spanked all his dear families for a long time till they were very warm and greatly astonished. He pulled out his tall ostrich ant's tail feathers and he caught his tall uncle, the giraffe, by the hind leg and dragged him through a thorn bush and he shouted at his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, and blew bubbles into her ear when she was sleeping in the water after meals. But he never let anyone touch Colo Colo Bird. At last, things grew so exciting that his dear families went off one by one in a hurry to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees to borrow new noses from the crocodile. When they came back, nobody spanked anybody anymore. And ever since that day, O oh best beloved, all the elephants you will ever see, besides all those that you won't, have trunks precisely like the trunk of the satiable elephant's child.